Hey, Ryan, thank you hey, so man. much for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here, bro. Dude, you look fantastic. Uh -huh. And uh, I, uh, I am here in Maine, and uh, I'm in a hotel room. It's kind of crazy. We were about to, uh, there was a, uh, a reconciliation service, a unity prayer vigil happening tonight, but there's an active shooter in the city that I'm in. So yeah. we are all advised to stay in our room. So I'm in my hotel and I Thanks, am man. so grateful to have this conversation. And I really believe um, that this is gonna be a massive benefit to people around the world. Um, and I'm gonna introduce you in a minute, but let me just pray because I think approaching any of these issues outside of the context of prayer and the presence is futile. Absolutely, 100%. So Lord, we just thank you for this privilege and this opportunity, God, to speak into these issues. I thank you for everybody that's joined us uh, from around the world, Lord. And, and um, thank you for those that, that, that are on here that don't like us. Thanks for those that don't agree with us, those that do agree with us. Lord, give the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God let that come in this moment, Lord. And I pray, God, that even in our conversation, Lord, that you would be all over this. As we navigate Sorry. these subjects, hear our heart, Lord, we, want, we don't want just rhetoric. We don't want just hashtags. We want the heart of the Lord to be present in this room. And we want to be commissioned as reconcilers, Lord, that carry yes. you to a broken world. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, amen. a little bit of context here. Um, Ryan Bomberger is not my one black friend. <laughs> just, to, just, to, I know that it's a cool thing right oh now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know it's a cool thing right now to, to have, you know, a, a white person, a black person on, and I'm grateful. And those conversations are really, are really helpful. Uh, well, some of them are really helpful, but I, uh, yeah. I've known Ryan for a really long time. We, uh, he actually... I don't know. I'm just trying to think, bro. We have a lot of history together. A lot, man. You were you were a kid, a little kid, youth group. A little punk. Wait. <laughs> no, but you were no. There was just something different about you, and I like that. You kind of uh, you drew a little bit of attention to yourself because you just didn't like the the normal sort of stuff, and um, <laughs> you like to shake things up. Yeah. You know. And of course, now that, that, that energy and that focus is on shaking things up for the kingdom. And it's awesome. And your heart was always like that when you were a kid. So yeah, we go back way, we, we don't have to back. say how we long go back. back. And, you know, I've been so thankful for Ryan because he's been so consistent in his message. And, you know, there's something about that. He's not a flip flopper. He's a man of conviction. Um, he's carried this activist, justice civil rights um, heart um, for the church for a very, very long time. So I know that it seems like we're in a society where, you know, in, in one moment, everybody's a disease expert. <laughs> the oh next God. minute, everybody's a civil rights expert. But I wanted to bring Ryan on because, you know, he's not just, you know, a, a, a black dude that's an amazing singer, by the way, um, and that has a beautiful Thanks, family, man. but he, he has been doing this for many years. Um, but I, the context of our conversation, and again, um, we're going to talk about everything. So everything that can be talked about, we're going to talk about here because there's a lot of things that are not being talked about that need to be. And so um, I know a lot of people might not, they might be angry, they might not agree, they might whatever, but this will be a sounding board of maybe a different opinion some of you guys haven't heard before. Um, I am going to introduce Ryan, and then he's going to do most of the talking. But the reason I felt really led to to engage with him, um, my heart has been grieved uh, over the last few days, over the last couple weeks. Of course, I'm grieving because of the senseless murdering of these of George Floyd and and these individuals. I I feel horrible for that. I I really do, and I think that we all should. I think unanimously around the world, we believe that this is a grave injustice. But the response of the church in in the face of this. Um, has been also something that's really grieved me. And this isn't a knock on any specific person or movement. I'm not even going to name names. I'm just saying in broad strokes, uh, I feel like that we might be missing our moment. 
Um, I feel like that God wants to utilize this. You know, he didn't cause this. He didn't cause this thing to happen. He didn't cause the riots. That's not his answer. But there is an upheaval right now across America like I've never seen. And I feel like people are actually leaning in. I feel like conversations are happening. I'm very thankful for that. I know I've had tons of conversations over the last uh, week and a half. But I started to, to remember this moment. I was 16 years old and I was at the mall in Washington, DC and I was, and Ryan was there. Yeah. And there was about 450,000, maybe more people that were gathered there. And it was a movement called The Call. And I'll never forget the moment that Ryan got on stage and I'll never forget when we went through this process where he was this racial reconciliation and this prayer for the unborn in America. And Ryan, this was the highlight of that whole 12 hours on the mall was Ryan getting up there because there was such authority in his mouth and there was such a tenderness in his heart. And we were all weeping and we were gathering hands and it was a spirit of unity that was so profound. It marked my heart and really it marked my heart with great hope for the, uh, for the racial relations and the unity of the church moving forward. I really was so encouraged and bro, I got to be really honest with you. Over the last week, I have thought about that moment. Here we are 20 years later. And I thought, gosh, it feels like we have just gone backwards. Yeah. Like it just feels like it's regressed. It feels like things have gotten worse. It feels like there's so much that is off subject we can't say. It feels like the world is driving the narrative of, of how this thing should look and sound and feel like. And so I'm burdened. This conversation, it doesn't, I don't have the answers. I believe Ryan has a lot of them, <laughs> um, but I want to give him an opportunity to share his heart. And so we're just going to get into it. Um, do you remember that moment? Oh, I can never forget that moment, man. I was a, I was a hot mess on that stage. <laughs> I was uh, crying and weeping and the, just everything, just draining before he even got up on stage, just listening to a woman before me who was talking about her abortion. And that was, that was incredibly powerful. But to be able to go on that stage and to be able to share, I think this is, this is crucial for people to understand, to share how I came to be. Please, I, was conceived in, I was conceived in rape. I'm that 1% that's used 100% to justify abortion. So here I'm on this stage to sing a song over women who've chosen abortion because we serve a God of, of wholeness and healing. And I could barely make it through, the, I could barely make it through the song, but it was such a, a pivotal moment for me because I realized, wow, I, I have the story to tell. And because of the, because of my skin color, I can also tell certain stories that others can't, which is, is tragic because like the shirt says right here, truth, preach it. I don't care whether you're red, yellow, black, brown, or white. Truth is not relegated to a particular color. But unfortunately in our culture today, I'm able to say certain things that others cannot. But I grew up in a, in a model of racial reconciliation. I was adopted into a family of 15. 10 of us were adopted. White, black, white and black. I'm biracial, you know, I'm as black as Frederick Douglass. Uh, you got Native American, Vietnamese, all mixed, wow. love like crazy. So for me, one of the most ultimate acts of racial reconciliation, Sean, is a parent bringing a child into their home who doesn't look like them, you know, a child of a different, and I'm putting this in quotes, race, because we're all one human race, but loving him or her simply because they deserve to be loved. So that's, that's my beginning. I'm in an interracial marriage. I mean, just a few decades ago, that was illegal in the state of Virginia. Thanks to Loving versus Virginia, that Supreme Court case that overturned that insane racist law, I'm able to, you know, not break the law because I fell in love with someone whose melanin is different than mine. So my heart for racial reconciliation is just real. It's from day one. And as a Christian, that has to be my heart. And the gospel has to be my go-to. So that that call DC, what was that, 2000? Yeah, 2000. 2000. Yeah. I think that was a seismic shift for so many. What, what burdens my heart is that the church didn't model what was going on wow. in DC that day. If Explain the church had modeled it, well, if the church had, had modeled it and been unafraid to talk about, the, to engage in these conversations, to, to talk about, you know, why do we have 
a black church and a predominantly white church, why are we segregating ourselves? And, and I want to actually dismantle one thing. People talk about the church or Sunday being the most segregated hour uh, in the week. Look at a lot of corporate boards. So, <laughs> many of those are, are all white as well. Uh, look at Nike, you know, Colin Kaepernick to Nike. The entire executive leadership team is white. So th there's a lot of, I guess you could say, lack of skin diversity uh, on these boards. But that's, that's not my issue. The majority of the country is white. We have, we, I'm a minority, uh, and I'm actually a minority among minorities. But there is this, this sense that somehow we can achieve justice. We can achieve this, this sort of equity. We can achieve um, a, a mindset change by embracing the world's narrative by embracing a, a secular worldview. It will never happen. Right. It will never, I mean, how many times in history do we have to see that it will never happen? The civil rights movement in our country was rooted in the gospel. Come the on. gospel is liberation. Yeah. There is no freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And where the spirit of the Lord isn't, there's bondage. Yeah. And I, I, I see that played out. It's actually manifesting itself in city after city across this country that is burning because there's not freedom. That's not the, the, the freedom of Christ is not what's being embraced. Now, I will say I love seeing these, these breakouts of worship because that, that to me, that's what's rooted in the gospel. Go in there and, and humble yourselves and worship. Come on. But what we're seeing as a whole is a direct result of the church's failure to lead on issues of, I'm gonna broaden this, sin. Racism is a sin, injustice is a sin. The church is failing to lead and instead sheepishly following the world. Wow. So you see an entire generation that, I mean, I, I and it, let's just, I don't know, let's hit on a couple of these things. Let's talk about Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I want to bring this up because, uh, and I posted, made a post last night, probably a lot of you maybe are on this be, because of that post. I, I wasn't actually making that post to, as clickbait. I know that that's a hot thing right now to get attention. I was just posting it because I was getting so many questions from white and black friends. Like, do you not, you know, do the blackout square? Why don't you do Black Lives Matter? Why do you have a problem saying that? You need to say it, you need to say it, you need to say it. And um, I felt like it was important for me to, to make a statement and say, well, listen, this is, this is one of the reasons why I'm not making that hashtag. And this is one of the reasons why I agree with, yes, that Black Lives Matter, but the movement as a whole is a fraud. And what they represent is not Black Lives Matter. So I don't know, can you talk a little bit about that and your thoughts on them? Man, absolutely. In fact, I just wrote an article, um, radiance.life slash BLM, and it's the top 10 reasons why I will never support the Black Lives Matter movement. As a Christian, our vision has to be different. We always talk about how we have to be discerning, but we cannot be discerning if we're not first committed to learning. And so many Christians are embracing this movement, and many, many are justifying it. Well, I, I embrace the concept. Well, concepts are abstract. A concept is abstract. When it's acted upon, it's no longer abstract. It's a cause. It's a movement. Right. And you have so many Christian leaders who refuse to even understand what the movement is. You can look at their policy platform. You've got the Black Lives Matter Foundation, the three young women who, who created the hashtag. They know it's more than a concept. In fact, they talked about it. We started this movement to spread black power across the country. Black power. Now, I, I'm... I side with Martin Luther King Jr. when he says, you know, let us not be dissatisfied until that day when no one will shout white power, when no one will shout black power, but we will all shout God's power and human power. See, I'm with him on this whole thing. So when you talk about this movement, what is the movement? And as a Christian, there's no way that you can actually go on to blacklivesmatter.com or you can go to m 4 the number 4 org, which is the Movement for Black Lives. It's the umbrella organization hugely funded. Uh, Ford Foundation decided that it was going to raise $100 million for the movement for Black Lives. But look at that website and read their policy, their policy positions. How can the church possibly embrace it? My, my biggest issue is, first and foremost, on either one of the sites, there is no call for, for forgiveness. 
there's no call for reconciliation. You cannot talk about the sins of the past. You cannot talk about sin if there is not the component of forgiveness. There can be no transformation without forgiveness. There can be no moving forward without forgiveness. So that first and foremost is is my issue. There are so many other issues on that. The the Black Lives Matter movement um, doesn't doesn't believe in, well, it's focused and fixated on, on color. I'm not calling for colorblind society. I love all of our colors. From, from off-white, which is what you are, because no one's actually truly white, from off-white to, to near black, all these hues are beautiful, but I am not going to be defined by my pigmentation. It doesn't tell you what my moral convictions are. It doesn't tell you what my, my worldview is. And yet, the entire movement is fixated on race, about black power, black power, black identity. Our position is un, unapologetically black. Well, what does that mean? My position is unapologetically Christian. There's no qualifier before Christian for me. I am a Christian. When we become one with Christ, there is no longer the black body of Christ. There is no, there's no Hispanic body of Christ. There's no white body of Christ or Asian body of Christ. There is the body of Christ. And so when you have a movement that rejects in its entirety our theology, why are we following it? I mean, they're radically pro-homosexuality and transgenderism. Right. They're anti-fatherhood. They talk about dissembling or, or dismantling the, the whole westernized nuclear understanding yeah, of nuclear yeah. family. They never mention fathers. There's, there's a reason for that, because you can't promote homosexuality and transgenderism and everything that's LGBTQ and embrace fatherhood. Yet, when we talk about the systemic racism that they're addressing, the... The biggest causal factor in, in negative disparities in the black community is the absence of the father. It is the reason for higher crime rates. It's the reason for higher dropout rates in school. It's the reason for higher abortion rates. It's the reason for higher drug, uh, drug usage. When the father sips out of the family, the family's vulnerable. When families are vulnerable in a, in a, vulnerable in a community, the community is vulnerable. Fatherhood is the largest contributing factor to a lot of these negative outcomes. And yet, how as a Christian can I look at a movement that completely disregards fatherhood when our father is the father to the fatherless? Wow. It makes no sense to me. Wow. And as a father of four wow. who was adopted by a father who loved those that other men abandoned, fatherhood is foundational. So there are many theological and scriptural issues that I have with the the movement, but when there's no heart of reconciliation, when there's no recognition of what God created, the model of family, that is the stability in any community, white, black, mixed, whatever it is, family is that stability. Right. And so I, I really challenge the the concept. So, so my question would be, you know, um, I feel like uh, and this is not to shame, please hear, hear our hearts. This is not to shame anybody that's used the hashtag or pushed the, uh, or made a sign with that. That's not this. We're no. just trying to navigate what is really the underbelly. What, what, what is the agenda behind these movements? And I do agree with you. I think that the church abdicated her right. And so in came an agenda from the world that now that it seems like a lot of the church is getting behind. How do we fix that? And what would you tell people of course, I, you know, you, you could call it the mob or pressure, whatever you want to call it, but there is a lot of intense pressure, and I've gotten told uh, no less than probably 500 times in the last week that I'm racist because I won't post Black Lives Matter, which I'm not even going to respond to those people. But what would you tell, I guess, white America like uh, that struggles with this and, you know, people... There, there, there might be African Americans that say, "Well, you need to get behind at least the, the the premise of it. Maybe if you don't even believe it, you gotta redeem it or know what we mean when we use it." What What is your advice? What do we do? How do we navigate this as right. lighter pigment <laughs> American? Well, well, part of that is actually the language, the vernacular that we use. You said white America, man. We're America. Part of the issue is that we are so inclined to putting people into a group. And, and, and I'm guilty of this too. In fact, when you, when you kind of use some of the vernacular of the world to try to talk about a situation, we kind of fall into the trap too. But part of it is because we are identifying first as color. Remember, scripture never identifies anybody by race. 
that's just a human construct. I mean, Acts 17, we are from one blood. Right. So part of it is not allowing ourselves to look through race colored glasses. It's a, it's a broken prism. And yet so many people fall into this. Part of this, this whole issue is that people feel, and, and I applaud those who want to fight injustice and just aren't willing to sit in their butts. They're actually getting up and doing something. However, as Christians, we have a, a much higher calling. It's not just a concept. For instance, back in the, in the 60s, Martin Luther King Jr. denounced black power. Now, if hashtags were existent then, he would not have been promoting a hashtag black power. It's just a concept. Well, he didn't agree with it because he understood the aims of it. Wow. I mean, his, his counterpart would have been Malcolm X, who was anti-integration. He was pro-violence. And he was espousing black power to the point of violence. He said, we love those who love us, and we aren't violent against those who aren't violent against us. But we are violent against those who are violent against and, us. And, and by the way, I want to just insert that a lot of voices that people are listening to, like Sean King, that's their role model is Malcolm X. Oh, Cal Colin Kaepernick. I mean, he, he basically worships him. He posts so much about Malcolm X and the speeches, and, you know, by any means necessary. It's not a nonviolent approach. Malcolm X called Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. and Uncle Tom, which wow. just to clarify for people, Uncle Tom is not a pejorative. If you've actually read Uncle Tom's Cabin and you're accusing the person who was willing to give up his life so that others could be set free, then call me an Uncle Tom for life. But he, he thought it was a, a pejorative to call Martin Luther King Jr. an Uncle Tom. But here you had two individuals who had a goal of racial justice, right? But their methods were radically different. MLK wow. did not embrace this movement, did not embrace the Black Power movement. Why as Christians are we so willing to jump in and embrace a movement? Why are so many quick to jump in and say, you know what, I'm not guilty, but I'm white. I will allow myself to be accused. That, that's, dude, that's, that's critical race theory. Critical race theory, if I had to sum it up in a sentence, it looks at people based on the color of their skin and places them into two categories, the oppressed and the oppressors. The oppressed are always white. The oppress, I'm sorry, the, oppress, the oppressors are always white and the oppressed are always black. That is not a biblical worldview. Wow. Victimhood is not a biblical worldview. And for a God who forgives us, this is when you're asking, how can we look at this differently and act differently? For a God who forgives us of anything that we've done, when we repent, he no longer holds it against us. Then how can we as individuals, how could I as, as a brown person hold you as a white person guilty of an act that you did not directly commit, but then put you in this collective and say, you're all responsible. I'm holding you responsible. I'm not going to forgive you, even though I've been forgiven my own personal sins. That is the heart, unfortunately, of the Black Lives Matter movement. I know it's not the heart of many of the activists who are and Christians who are kind of walking alongside of them. It is not the heart of the movement. And if it's not the heart of the movement, we're going in the wrong direction. Wow. I, it breaks my heart. I'm raising, I have three mixed kids and a, and a black, and a young, my youngest is black. I have two adopted kids out of my four kids. I don't want to raise them in a world where their identity isn't first rooted in Christ. Come on. That's their identity. Because as mixed kids, I mean, what do you do? Colin Kaepernick is a perfect example. He's biracial. He was adopted as well. Do you give up half of your identity, which is what he's done? I mean, if you're half Italian and half German, do you say, I'm Italian? No, you're Italian and German. That's why our identity has to be in something that is fixed, that is constant, that doesn't waver. And what we're seeing is a world that constantly wants identity in the things that are temporal. Dude, you're taking us to school. This is incredible. <laughs> so what would you say to people that I believe that God's fashioned a generation for justice? I do. I really believe it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a theme that we've run with. I mean, believe it or not, whether people agree with this or not out there, it's the reason why I ran for U.S. Congress. Um, nobody wants to do that. I never wanted to do that. But my heart for justice right. burned so strong because I saw the corruption, you know, right. predominantly in California, because that's where I've been living. And that's what drove me to do that. That's what drove me to Iraq, blah, 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 blah. This is what drives our generation. I believe we have that on us to, 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 for justice, um, for empathy. 
where, what would be your encouragement to people in this season that have a heart for justice and have a right. heart to put empathy? It feels like to me that it's being like sorely misguided into some of the things we're talking about. What would be your encouragement to them? How can they channel that when they're worried about systematic racism? They're worried about white privilege. I want to talk about these things. They're worried about police brutality. How do you channel that? What do you do with that energy? Well, I consider myself a factivist, Sean. And it's not just being an activist, because too many people are acting without the facts. As Christians, we should not be acting without a clarified understanding of what's going on. I, I think we, we understand in the eternal, truth sets us free. But that's also true in, in this temporal space, here on this side of heaven. If we're not willing to understand the truth and the context of issues, how do you responsibly act? Let's look at the premise of Black Lives Matter, for instance. Black Lives Matter is, is, is predicated on the assertion that uh, there is an epidemic of black people being killed by police, that pr police brutality is the, the leading cause of death, you would think, among black individuals. Now, I'm not dismissing any loss of life. Any life that is unjustly killed deserves justice, 100%. There is racism out there, yes, uh, and it does exist, and we have to address it, but the, the premise of Black Lives Matter is so faulty in that just looking, okay, I looked at 2020 stats this year of, of individuals killed by police. There were, you know, two, two Native Americans killed. There were seven or nine Asian individuals killed. There were 46 Hispanics killed. There were 76 black individuals killed. There were 149 white individuals killed, of which we never hear from national mainstream media, of course. Of the 76 black individuals who were killed by cops, nine were unarmed. Of all those who were killed by, by cops, 90% of those individuals, of the, the ones who were deemed as a victim, were armed with a deadly weapon. So this changed the context. I, we cannot operate out of fear. I mean, we're told by scripture what? God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I will not operate in fear. But yet, how many, how many teens, minority, minority teens I, I've addressed in conferences, so many of them feel like they are so likely to be killed stepping outside of their home. That's what LeBron James, King James said. He said, we are literally hunted down every time, every day we step outside of the comfort of our homes. Is that true? Of course it isn't. And you want to talk about systemic racism. Our organization, the Radiance Foundation, fights systemic racism where it's blatant in the abortion industry. It seems to be the only acceptable form of white supremacy out there where 360 black lives are killed every single day. And the reason why I bring this up because people say, well, that's deflection, that's deflection. No, the Black Lives Matter movement announced solidarity with the abortion industry. They announced solidarity with the leading killer of black lives. It's completely relevant. So we can't go into this not understanding the context. We can't go into this understanding, wait a minute, What's their worldview? What's their end goal? What's their end game? And I don't think enough Christian leaders, I don't think enough Christian individuals are asking themselves that question. Some, someone um, wrote to us, and we, we've gotten a lot of messages over the past several weeks on this, but she said, you know, she's, a, she's an adoptive parent, she has black children, and they experience discrimination, and, and she started listing all these things. I said, the Black Lives Matter movement is not going to change that circumstance. What changes that circumstance is that the church talks about these issues and talks about it from a healing perspective that can only come from the God of unity. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 talks about love is the only thing that binds us in perfect unity. The Black Lives Matter movement is not going to stop the discrimination. In fact, because it's fixated on these beautiful hues of our skin, because it's fixated on being black, it will actually exacerbate or worsen the situation because you're always going into a situation black first and everything else follows going into a situation white first and everything else follows so uh, there are some pastors who speak on this sean vody bacham oh my goodness v-o-d-d-i-e bacham b-a-u-c-h-a-m people um Man, powerful African-American pastors who talk about the issue of race, who talk about racism, who talk about the things that are plaguing poor black communities. Man, this is powerful stuff. Dr. Tony Evans as well. They give a firm biblical perspective 
on these issues. And so what I think is Christians, instead of being reactionary, always oh, reactionary, always, oh, I see this, this injustice, and I love that you're passionate about it, but stop acting without knowing. Wow. It leads to disastrous consequences. And we're seeing it obviously from coast to coast right now. I, I, I'm not sure which is worse, apathy or acting out of ignorance. I'm not sure which is more dangerous, but I do know that the church is never supposed to do either. Wow. Wow. Sorry, my <laughs> mind's just being blown. Um, that's incredible. Do you, how do you approach this? <laughs> and by the way, it's Ryan's fault for the title of this thing. Uh, white, woke, oh and spiritually gosh. broke. It's, it's kind of amazing. I don't know if he thought we were really going to run with it, but we did. I didn't. <laughs> um, let's talk about the wokeness. Let's talk about um, the, this whole thing of you got to be woke, you got to know what's going on. How, I don't know, air your thoughts out there. Okay, I, I, I'm a creative, and so visual, I, I, I create things visually, I create things sonically, and I think of what does it mean to be woke? If we're awakened, what happens? Your eyes are open, right? You're seeing. Yet so many of these people who define themselves as woke don't see what's right in front of their faces. How can you be woke if you can't see what's so evident? I mean, I, I, the, the confusion is people think that they're being compassionate. People think that they're being loving and understanding by identifying. But we have to be careful with what we're identifying with. People will constantly say, you know, they're woke because, you know, I, I listened to her lived experience. Well, guess what? We all have lived experiences. And, and guess where a lot of lived experiences lead us? To a lie. Just because someone lived an experience doesn't mean that they've embraced the truth. I mean, many of us throughout our lives have embraced a lie. It wasn't the lived experience that makes it true. It was pursuing truth, which is, which is God, which is the gospel. That's what makes it true. True you know, there's not the, the my truth and the your truth and the our truth. There's just the truth. And so this whole wokeness is all, it's, it's basically moral relativism. Right. I'm woke because I feel this way. Well, that's nice, but is it true? The same thing with the premise of Black Lives Matter. Is it true? Does it? And when you discover that it's no longer true, does that matter to you? Yeah. And what I'm hearing from a number of my my colleagues and friends who are Christian leaders, it doesn't. So when you actually know the truth and you're not acting upon it, how woke are you? Your eyes are still closed. You're still blind. You're, you're willfully blind. So I know that the heart for a lot of these, a lot of individuals who identify that way, uh, and whether they're white, black, or any human between who think that they're woke, I know a lot of times that heart is, is an intention of good. I know that. Right. But good is not good enough. There cannot be justice without truth. Justice is, is the, the, the conforming to fact or reason, right? That's, that's what justice means because you can't have justice if you don't have fact and reason. So that means you cannot have justice without truth. You know, in Psalm, it talks about um, truth and justice are the foundation of your throne, O God. The two are inseparable. We cannot pursue justice if we don't know the truth. Yeah. And so for all those woke people. <laughs> well, and I, I, I feel like, I feel like too, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of shame induced uh, uh, force that's coming on, you know, non-African Americans right now where, there is this push of to acknowledge that you're privileged and acknowledge that you're da da da. And if you don't conform, then you're a racist or you're whatever, <laughs> which we know that's not true, but, but no. can you speak into that? Like, how do you, how do you encourage or what do you tell privilege uh, Christians when it comes to this white privilege thing and this whole narrative that's being kind of created? There's books on it. I mean, there's really, uh... really popular books that a lot of Christians are reading on it right now. It's really unbelievable. Again, this is what happens when you supplant the word of God with worldly knowledge. <laughs> 
And I'm not saying that our Christian worldview can be bolstered by understanding the facts and statistics. And that's what I do all the time. But when it's replaced with ideologies like critical theory, critical race theory, um, Peggy McIntosh, she is a professor. She's the one who came up with this whole white privilege concept. I don't know if you've ever read through the 46 points she makes of white privilege, but they're some of the most ridiculous things possible. One of the things she said is, I know it's white privilege when I can go into a store and I, I can always find records and, and albums of people of my race. I'm like, and this was in the 80s that she wrote this. I think it was 85 or 86. Are you telling me that in 1985 and 1986, you didn't see albums of black individuals? I, I wasn't, I don't say how old I am, but um, I was in school, uh, high school at that time. There were plenty of albums of people of my complexion. It's that, it's that assertion that is actually based on a total lie where she develops this whole white privilege thing. The whole thing is, you know, if you have, if you have a, you know, like a Kanye West and he has a child and Kanye is black. I don't know if people know that, but Kanye is black. Although there are lots of people who challenge whether or not he's black or not, because apparently, you know, <laughs> ideological slavery. But anyway, so Kanye West's child supposedly doesn't have privilege because simply by the, the, the virtue that Kanye is black. But then you have a, a poor white family or individual, single mom, who's raising her poor white child. But somehow she has white privilege. Who's more advantaged? There are things that give people privilege, if you want to call it that, advantages, socio socioeconomic advantages, absolutely. But this whole blanket statement of white privilege is part of a bigger problem for me, especially as someone who's worked in inner city ministries and with young children for decades. Right. My, my bigger issue is that it's an external thing. White privilege and systemic racism and all these things that are, that are the, the, the blame make everything external. There's never an instance throughout, for instance, the Black Lives Matter main websites where it ever talks about personal responsibility. I'm not saying it's always the individual. I'm obviously right. not. Right. But what all these things do is say, you know what? You're, you cannot control these things. They're all external to you. It is not your fault. But yet you remove those things and will you still have negative disparities in health outcomes, negative disparities in economic outcomes? Of course you will. Because as individuals, we act upon things and we ha there are consequences to all those actions. So systemic racism, I mean, what was more systemic than, than codified racism in the 60s? I mean, when people like me had to ride in the back of the bus and sit up in the balcony and had to, couldn't even sit at you know, the, the, the counter. There were things that were systemic. I think what people often confuse today as systemic racism are instances of specific racism. Mm. For instance, if you encounter a white person, at, me as a brown person, I encounter a white person who was me, I mean, for instance, I, I remember growing up and being called a tar baby. And at the time I didn't know what it was. And I remember asking my brother, what's a tar baby? Uh, I, I could say all white people are racist because of that, that specific instance. Right. Or because of the, 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 I could count many instances of racism that I encountered, but I am not going to say as a whole, all white people are racist. But this is what systemic racism and the cries for it does. It looks at specific instances and then wants to attribute it to an entire system. And the, the, the funny, not funny, but the ridiculous thing for me is that those who are decrying systemic racism and they say it's in every institution in America, don't see it in the one institution that kills for a living, the abortion industry. So they don't see it there where people are actually killed <laughs> by the thousands every day, but they see it everywhere else, which then makes me want to challenge the notion that, that what they're actually seeing is systemic racism in all these cases. Well, what's interesting too is I've, you know, my, my DMs have been blown up, you know, since, since we've, um, you know, since all of this has happened. And a lot of them are from, you know, black friends of mine and they're, you know, they're asking me, Hey, listen, like, Everyone's saying I need to tell my kids this, or maybe it's a white couple that adopted, um, you know, a, a black child or something. You know, what do I tell my kids? And, and and you know, my replies, I was like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you know, one guy's like, you know, I, I never had a bad confrontation with the police officer. I never had an issue. I never had, you know, but I, but everyone's telling me I need to warn my kids. And I'm like, well, you don't need to take borrowed offense. Like, I don't know. It just to me, it feels like there's a pressure to. I mean, I agree, you know, 
I went to high school in, in, in Tidewater. It's kind of 50, 50 or maybe 60, right. 40. I don't know. And I, I just, it feel everything is so hypersensitive. And I'm not saying that those, those things do not exist, that there's not racist cops, that there's not people that are racist. There 100% is, and they need, they need to get blasted. Jesus. They need Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. You know, they need Jesus. But I, it's, it's, and I, you know, I get around a bit, you know, around the world a bit. I get around America a bit. I'm just a little bit. Of, just a little bit. In a lot of different communities, a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different um, conversations uh, of racial reconciliation, not just here, but I mean, all over the world. Uh, but I feel like there's this pressure for even minorities to have to carry an offense right. that maybe they, they haven't had that experience. You know, our burdens are not supposed to be carried by us. They're supposed to be carried by the Lord. And this whole taking on the offense, what kind of fruit does it produce? I, this whole fake guilt thing and, and, and being shamed into, that's not a godly approach. You know, God doesn't shame us into becoming part of the, the family of God. Um, so what do you so, tell people that have had real experiences though? Like, like we're saying that I have a real, you know, they walk into a store and a white woman clutches their purse because they're worried they're going to get robbed or they see a group of black guys walking on the street and they're worried their cars are going to get broken into. What are you, what is your response to people that have either felt that themselves or they've, either they felt worried or scared themselves or they've seen somebody feel that towards them, you know? Right. Well, well, I have, I have throughout my life, but I refuse to submit to this mentality that I'm always going to be a victim. People are going to be wrong. I mean, we live with this sort of mentality that somehow we can eradicate racism. We work to, we work to eliminate it. Absolutely. But it is one of many sins that will exist as long as humankind exists. So, it's not just racism. I mean, you look look at the, the look at slavery itself, race based slavery here in the United States. Was it the result simply of skin color? And I want to challenge people to, on this. How was it enabled in the first place? What motivated slavery? Why do people need slaves? Greed. Why do people of my complexion sell out their own brothers and sisters on the west coast of Africa? Greed. Why did black individuals who became freed people now some became some became slave masters themselves. Some it was to to release next to kin, absolutely. But there are many. In fact, uh, Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates writes art uh, has written numerous articles on this. Some were in it to make money. So we have this sort of mentality that we have to take on this guilt. But I'm like, well, who should take on the guilt? I, I was told when I spoke at Wheaton College once that white people are respect are, are responsible for their collective sin. I'm like, well aren't we actually responsible for our individual sin? And if you want to talk about slavery, whose collective sin do we talk about? Because we have to talk about the, the black individual, the tribalism that led to the selling off of black men and women and children to enable the transatlantic slave trade. We have to talk about the, the free blacks who became the slave masters. It just, the taking on of all of this may signal to somebody else that you're virtuous. It may signal to something, somebody else that you care, but there has to be something deeper than taking on false guilt. Our churches need to have, the, the, see, the church that we went to, Sean, dude, it did not become what it was. I guess I won't name the church, but it didn't become what it was because of critical race theory. It didn't become what it was because of a hashtag movement. It became what it was because people were authentically seeking relationships with those who were different and not just by skin color, but socioeconomic status. That church is so diverse on so many levels. Right. And right. none of that came about because of an embrace of a secular worldview, but because of the embrace of the gospel. Come on. Woo! Wow, that and you're oh, you are articulating to me. I think that community that we grew up in and how that was so transformative. Yeah, and why now today I'm looking at the church going, what is what's happening? Like we're losing the handle on this thing. Um, we don't. I we're not going to go too much longer, but we can't we can't not talk about 
the elephant in the room. I get hammered with this all the time. But what about Trump? You know, how can you support, how can you fight racism, Sean, but you supported a racist president? I mean, I get this comment all the time and I'm not afraid to talk about it because Christians aren't talking about it. So we're going to, um, what do you think? I actually don't know what you think. We haven't pre-talked about this, so I want to hear Ryan's. <laughs> well, for me, Ephesians 4.14 is how I have approached so much of the work that I do through the Radiance Foundation. It talks about not being tossed to and fro by every wind of new teaching, to not be tricked by lies so clever they sound like the truth. This is what happens. The... <laughs> There's obviously a political dimension to this. And I'm going to say this, that neither party is our salvation. Only Christ is our salvation. Preach. First and foremost, okay? Preach. And, and I'll add this. It sucks that there's a two-party system. And it yes. sucks sometimes you have to choose the lesser two evils. And, you know, when you engage in the political world like I did, you have to pick what I believe was the lesser of two evils. That's my right. own personal opinion. But anyway, right. keep going. I mean, but just let's, let's kind of look just a quick brief history of American history. Who was the party of slavery? The party of Jim Crow? The party of separate and definitely not equal? The party that, that actually refused to vote for women's right to vote, the 19th Amendment? Who, who was that particular party? Who was the party that enabled the enslavement of those of my complexion and fought for it? Wow. Who, who created, you know, people talk about the Confederacy, their, their whole constitution was in protection of slavery. But which political party was that? It was the Democrat Party. And now, just stay with me for a second. Democrat Party now is the, the party of limitless abortion. Which demographic is hardest hit by abortion? The black community. Wow. The black demographic. In New York City, more black babies are aborted than born alive. For every 1,000 born alive, 1,033 are aborted. You want to talk about systemic racism? Let me define it for you. Systemic racism is a government-funded entity that disproportionately kills black lives. Planned Parenthood gets half a billion dollars every year from taxpayers. And they boast. In fact, they tweet things like, black women, you are statistically safer to have an abortion than to give birth or to carry a pregnancy to term. What if, now you asked about Trump. That those are their words verbatim. So they're telling black women, you're better off killing your posterity. What if Trump had tweeted those words, Sean? Dude, what if he said, black women, you're better off killing your, your having abortion is kill your child. I mean, people would have cried white supremacy. It would have been like racism, racism. But because Planned Parenthood tweets it, it's okay. So people get, I, what does racism mean anymore? What does it actually mean? There is actual racism. And then there's a whole lot of alleged racism. We're at now at the point, this is a real point, Sean, where just a few days ago, someone who's a sportscaster for the Sacramento Kings was fired because he responded to a question, what do you think about the Black Lives Matter movement on Twitter? And he said, all lives matter, every single one. He was accused that all lives matter is now racist. It's not enough that it dismisses, as, as many activists say, it dismisses the importance of what's being said in Black Lives Matter. It's now racist. This is, the po this is where we've come. So when you talk about Trump, dude, um, I will say as a Christian, and I've been, I'm an equal opportunity scrutinizer, so I have criticized Trump many, <laughs> many times, his moral failings. And I found it funny when Christianity Today called for his ouster because if their litmus test is immoral politician, Oh, let's get rid of the entire gamut of every politician because if immorality is that litmus test, wow. Oh my uh, and God. then what do you go? He, he wasn't as sinful as she was and she wasn't as sinful yeah. as he was. <laughs> Give me a break. But yeah. when it comes to policies as Christians, we have to be able to reconcile our faith with right. the policies that are enacted. Unfortunately, we had the choices that we did years ago, but I'm not going to choose uh, Hillary Clinton, who's radically pro-abortion, who's radically pro-homosexuality, who said that we need to change our religious beliefs to embrace abortion and homosexuality. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. She's also one who, des who described black men as super predators. So in, in, in talking and denouncing the, those with black skin who apparently were just a menace to society. So you want to talk about racist? Um, there's plenty. And I went and go into whole Joe Biden's determination of who's black and who ain't, you know, you ain't black. Really? <laughs> I'm going to have some politician. That was, have some politician. That was, one of the, that was one of the craziest 
I mean, you know, I, getting into this political world, that literally was one of the craziest statements I've ever seen in my life. Anybody make. And Trump said a lot of crazy things. That was pretty crazy. Lots. Lots of it. Um, I mean, you're, you're but, literally telling people that you're the one defining blackness. That blackness is then, then isolated to a political allegiance? Really? But see, that's the whole problem. That's, that's why when we define ourselves by the, the beautiful hues of our skin, it leads to disastrous consequences, always. So what do you, so how, how do Christians that, first of all, so quickly back to Trump, how do Christians that want to support uh, racial equality or justice or, or, or whatever, but have a hard time with Trump, what do you say to them? Um, they need to see they need to see his policies get past all the mainstream media rhetoric mainstream media's heart is never reconciliation the whole phrase if it bleeds it reads Preach. they thrive on friction Preach. they thrive on division that's what they do and they've hated trump before he even got into office so that's the whole i mean he wasn't a racist before he got into office by the way jesse jackson didn't think he was a racist oprah didn't think he was racist al sharpton didn't think he was a racist until he started calling them out but anyway that that whole thing look at the policies We've had the lowest black and, and, and Hispanic uh, unemployment rates in history under Trump. Right. HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, have received their most funding under Trump. The first step program, criminal justice reform, which I'm an advocate for, was signed under Trump. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It's why we're seeing such an increase in support among black Americans for Trump, because when you look at the policies and you look at the equality that he is fighting for, he's also the one who's been staunchly fighting for free speech. The very speech that these protesters are demanding that they must have, he's a staunch supporter of it. Now, he's not a staunch supporter of the chaos and the lawlessness, but free speech itself, 100%. He's been one of the most powerful presidents on the issues of free speech. Of course, he I will say he abuses his speech sometimes uh, on Twitter. It's, it, it makes me cringe. But in the end, my focus and my reliance, my worldview is not being shaped by that president. Right. My worldview is being, is being shaped by scripture that regardless of who is president in, in the White House, it will be the constant. And so I I'd really just, people, you have to dig deep, get past these, these veneers, get past these, these destructive narratives that are always political in nature, that are always political in nature, and find out what's actually being done, what's actually being said. And quite honestly, the achievements in the black community uh, from President Trump are pretty remarkable. Um, his efforts, to, even during the coronavirus, many people don't know this because mainstream media doesn't, doesn't report on it. I've been in these meetings, all the, all the measures taken to help um, you know, healthcare systems in black communities be able to deal with some of these issues, some of the healthcare disparities, but no one hears about these programs. No one hears about the funding. No one hears about the task force because, you know, racism. It's just easier to say racist and turn away and go on your, your merry way. But Christians, we, we must do better. We have to do better. So, man, we've had on a lot of stuff and I, I <laughs> want to wrap this up and we probably should do like, part two and part three and part four because <laughs> I'm I'm just sitting here getting really actually getting enlightened and learning so much. I, I want to circle back to how it began the conversation um, around the reconciliation that we in, encountered together when we were in uh, Washington, D.C. 20 years ago. Um, how do we as believers become brokers of that, of that reconciliation? What does that look like? How do we, we you've, you've kind of debunked some of the things and, and we've learned a lot of the, um, the traps that are along the way, but what, what does reconciliation look like specifically towards the white community? Reconciliation comes in so many different forms, man. It comes in genuine relationships and, and you can't, and, and this isn't just based on skin color. Get to know people who, who aren't like you, who aren't in the same socioeconomic class or who don't ideologically think what you think. But if we're not willing to do this out there, I know, get people. outside of them, please break outside of that. There, look, if we don't love one another, we will never get to that point of reconciliation. And loving one another does mean being humble and saying, I will listen. We, right. 
Right. And I agree with that part. There does need to be the listening, but there also needs to be the listening of the, the, the word of God, because you can't just listen to experience. As I said before, experience can, can mislead us. And it certainly misleads us. It doesn't always lead us to the right uh, conclusion. But if we're not willing, look, when you love somebody, you want the best for them. We know as parents, right? And you're, you're adorable kids. I mean, when you love somebody, you will go all out for them. You will, by nature, love is self-sacrificial. So when you love somebody, you don't want them to be harmed. When you love someone, you want justice to happen to them. When you love someone, you don't want to see them a slave to addiction. When you love someone, you don't want them to be pregnant and afraid and alone. When you love someone, it changes everything. And when you teach your kids, we do this all the time. We meet kids with physical disabilities. We meet kids from so many different backgrounds on our events with the Radiance Foundation. And our kid, it's such a natural part because they are exposed to things that aren't the same. I know it's not easy for everybody because sometimes people live in a, a kind of like homogenous sort of communities. I mean, you're in Maine. <laughs> I'm just yeah. saying that it, it's not the most <laughs> diverse part of the United States. <laughs> superficially, I'm saying superficially because diversity right. goes deeper than skin. But if we're not willing to love and we're not willing to at least have the conversations in our churches, it's going to be really hard to get to that place of rec reconciliation. But we also have to make sure that these things line up with scripture. Right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So have the conversations, have people over for lunch, have people over for dinner, be intentional about partnering with churches that, and I hate the fact that we do have black churches and predominantly white churches, but there are plenty of mixed churches as well, but partner with one another. I think the best network that we have, Sean, in the world that can, that where reconciliation and this kind of thing can, can go out like an explosion, a nonviolent explosion, is the church. <laughs> We're already in every single community, in some Come communities on. on every city block. Come we on. already exist. Come we just on. don't utilize what God has already placed. And so, man, there, there are so many ways that, that we can do this. And, and even for people who feel like our, our conversation, season your conversation with grace. Come on. The, there are movements, and it's not, I'm not just picking on Black Lives Matter movement, but there are secular movements where, where grace and humility and love are not at the center of it. Wow. Have conversations where you're not assuming the worst of the next person. You might not agree with a fellow Christian about Black Lives Matter, but don't write them off. Don't unfriend them in real life, and don't unfriend them virtually, okay? <laughs> I mean, th these are simple little ways. But we get so wrapped up, and that should just that should be such a, an alarm set off for people. Like, wait a minute, if I'm now making a debt, and I've seen this, in fact, someone in my own life has, has done this, person, the, the whole, I will completely write you off. You don't agree with the Black Lives Matter movement. Do not talk to me. I want no relationship. No relationship is the devil's way of doing work. Wow. Genuine relationships built on love and forgiveness and understanding and listening. That's godly. So uh, the, the church Bro. just has to do better on so Listen, many I, levels. Come on. You are preaching. I mean, I, this is what has been grieving me and I feel summoned into this. Um, I don't feel summoned into this thing knowing the answers. I don't know the answers. That's why I went to St. Louis a couple nights ago. We did worship. You know, we were we were standing and, and worshiping a block a block or two away from where four police officers were shot. There was going to be riots that night. And I'm telling you, it is not cheap. There's people out there that believe that worship and praying is cheap. It's a cheap way out. I'm telling you, it's the only way out. No, it's and the it's only up. place of breakthrough. It is the only it's, place where we can on. find like sanity in the midst of this. And so my encouragement, my encouragement to close this out is just, guys, we have to do better. The church, we have to, some of you guys need to unplug for a hot minute from the cesspool of social media that drives yes. a narrative. You need to get with the Lord. You need to get with people and pray. You need to get in the presence. You need to find your soul again. Right. <laughs> and that goes for all again. of us, white, black, and every hue in between. The Holy Spirit convicts, Sean. This whole shaming and this whole blaming, uh-uh. But if we're not worshiping together and we're not going to that word, this this... Right here, man. If we don't go to this 24-7, we're never going to have the right outcome. 
man. And worshiping together, that to me, having going back to that, that church, to me, that was the most powerful thing. You look around, you're seeing every tribe and every nation around you worshiping together. Come on. That changes things. Well, bro, I'm so thankful. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your knowledge. I learned a ton and I somehow will keep this going, but okay. I'm going to try to get this together and post it because you shared my heart, man. And I am so grateful for your insight. And I just want to thank you for your long time dedication. I know that the news cycle will change and that we'll be on. I mean, it was a virus, then it was this. You know, I, I saw some posts the other day, like it's the aliens turn in July. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> what's next? It's like, what next? Next, you know, it's like 2020. But um, <laughs> you're, when, when all the noise moves on, you're the one that's going to continue to do this. It's your life's work. And so I just honor you, bro. I love you, man, and I'm so grateful for you. And I would encourage everyone out there to share this. Get this out there. Let's create a different narrative. Let's become the church. Let's bring true reconciliation according to the Bible and according to our love and commitment for each other and yes. reconciliation. I love you so much, man. Thank you. Love you, man. What an honor.